It's good to be with you again. Our topic is holiness, but specifically when you're out of time. Someone said to me, or I heard it said recently, that one day time will end. There'll just be no more time. And when I first heard it, it frightened me. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've lived with it, the more I've prayed about it, it's exciting. Time can be a cruel taskmaster, but the purpose of being born again, becoming a part of the eternal kingdom of God is time doesn't own me. I'm on a completely different agenda. It's beyond time. My rewards are beyond time. The things I'm most excited about are beyond time. Don't let time be a cruel taskmaster in your life. He's a thief and he's fearful. Open your heart and grab your Bible. God's got something for you today. All right, the title for this session is Holiness When You're Out of Time. And it's really a companion to the Saturday evening message. If you didn't hear that, it lives out there in the digital world someplace. You can go to the website or YouTube. I know you can find it there. But I want to start in 1 Timothy chapter 2 in the first four verses. Paul is writing to a young man he's mentoring. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a priority statement before we get to any of the, the, the rest of the text. He says, first of all, before you pray for anything else, before you do anything else. And he commandeers a whole host of kinds of prayers. He says requests and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving. Prayer is a general word and he's identifying several components of prayer. He said, use all of those venues before you do anything else to pray for those who have authority over you. We have a biblical assignment to pray for those in authority over us. Authority over us in churches, authorities over us in our places of work and employment, authority over us in our homes, authority over us in our government. And then he tells us the outcome, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. The purpose of authority in this world is to promote godliness and holiness. That's our prayer, that godliness and holiness might be extended are you an advocate for godliness and holiness? I mean, like an out front, open, fully throated. You're like not timid or shy. I stand for godliness and holiness in this world. And I'll stand with those who promote it. That's our assignment. Well, I, I want to be sure you know it because I want to encourage you on a daily basis to pray for those in authority over us. Pray for the place where you work. Pray for your home. Pray for our government leaders from the lowest offices in the nation to the highest. Godliness and holiness is the objective. We just completed an election season. Hallelujah. I was grateful to complete it. But we have a biblical assignment to pray for those with authority over our lives. Whether the people you, you know, sometimes we get this a little wrong. If the people you wanted to win, win, you pray for them. And if the people you didn't want to win, you say, well, they're not mine. Yes, they are. They have authority over you. We have to pray either way. And the prayer is the same. That godliness and holiness would be promoted. It's not arbitrary. We have a, we've got a rule book. That godliness and holiness would be promoted. That we can live peaceful and quiet lives. We can't simply return to our state of indifference. The church has been there for too long or the spiritual coma that we found ourselves in at the beginning of 2020 when the disruptions began. We have a biblical assignment to be light in our world and we have to continue to pay attention, to pray, to seek God and to allow God's spirit to work within us. The problems we face, I've said it many times and I'm quite confident I will repeat it again. The problems we face as people are not rooted in the hearts of the ungodly. The wicked are not our problem. The challenge we face is the hearts of God's people. We've adopted a little paradigm and I'll commend it to you again. You wanna watch, listen, think. Please don't leave out thinking. And, and act. It's still important that we're engaged in our world. There are things happening on a daily basis that impact our futures, not just our immediate future, but our children and our grandchildren. And the church is to be light. 
In the last few days, something that's that stepped back into the public arena is something called the Equality Act. If you're not familiar with it, you should be. It's once again coming before Congress. Congress, it's already passed the House of Representatives once. I got a note this week, a notification from Franklin Graham. And I thought he said it better than I could, so I'll just quote. He said, the Biden administration has said they want to pass this Equality Act within their first 100 days. And I cannot say this more emphatically for people, for businesses, and for ministries of faith, the Equality Act is a threat to life as we know it in our nation today. It is a real game changer. The Equality Act designates schools, churches, healthcare organizations as public accommodations. And with this, schools, churches, hospitals could be forced to accept the government's beliefs and mandates about sexual orientation and gender identity. That would be highly intrusive and incredibly far reaching. It will threaten everyday speech where people can be fined or lose their jobs for using the wrong name or pronouns, end quote. Pay attention, think, pray. It makes a difference. You know, free speech in general is being closed down. Now, I understand, I earned a degree in history. It's protected by the First Amendment of our Constitution. It's the First Amendment in our Bill of Rights. But never mind the law, it is being set aside. We have tolerated through the years some very offensive things in an attempt to demonstrate our commitment to the sanctity of freedom of speech. Now, you don't have to be a very astute observer to know this. We've tolerated the burning of the American flag. It's a very offensive act to many, many of us, but we've tolerated the burning of the flag because we said it was protected by free speech. We've watched highly compensated athletes, some of the most privileged people amongst us, refuse to stand for the national anthem. And we tolerated it and accepted it because we understood it was an expression of free speech. But free speech has become a very limited commodity these days. If you disagree with the political, politically correct ideology of the day, you're not extended such grace and understanding. You may be fact-checked into silence. Or your moral compass may be determined to be too broken to allow you to speak freely. Hey, most recently, Mr. Potato Head was determined to be an offender. Mr. is a designation that is offensive to some. Therefore, it shouldn't be protected. Apparently, potato head is acceptable. <laughs> this is not new. We, we shouldn't be surprised, we've been asleep. We couldn't, we could, could have cared less. When I was in graduate school, theological graduate school at Vanderbilt University, and it's been a while, if I referred to God as Father, which is a part of my personal belief system, as well as scripture, I was told that it was insensitive and offensive. Whether it was in a paper or a public presentation, I had to change my language, my presentation, or suffer the consequences. This is not a new thing. We need clarity on this. Freedom of speech is not just for the pornographers or those who don't respect the history of our nation or for those who don't embrace the Judeo-Christian worldview. It's for all of us. We're light in this world and we have to have the courage to understand that. We talk about our responsibilities to the world. We live in a broken, fallen world. There is tremendous suffering and pain. And what do we do and how do we respond? It's not simple. There just aren't very many easy answers. It's why we have to watch and listen and prayerfully respond. I've encouraged you to, to, to think globally, but to act locally. It's who we are in our homes and our communities that, that make a difference. We're struggling as a nation with immigration policies. We don't want any fences at our borders, but we want them around our capital. It doesn't seem to make a great deal of sense. If we question current policy, we're often told that we're xenophobic or we lack compassion for the less fortunate or that we're old fashioned or we're uninformed. 
that we don't care about the poor. Well, I worked a little bit on the statistics. Our global population these days is about 8 billion people on planet Earth. About 8 billion with a B. Did you know that most of the world's population lives in poverty? Most of the world, about two-thirds of the global population live on less than $10 a day. Two-thirds of the global population have a daily income of less than $10. One in 10 has a daily income of less than $2. That means there's more than 5 billion people living in poverty. That should be a concern to us. But I would submit to you that immigration into our nation is not a rational way to deal with poverty and the suffering of the global population. Five billion people would overwhelm the resources we have. And a million people a year, that's about our, our legal immigration number, doesn't change that global opportunity. In fact, in some ways, we might even argue it, it, it hinders it because those that can afford or those that are able to immigrate legally step away from those places where their abilities and, and things are most needed. Now, I'm an advocate for immigration. We're a nation of immigrants. But opening our borders does not solve the global challenge. Immigration policy, I don't know what the objective is, but the, it, it cannot be about global poverty. In fact, the enormous cost of extending citizenship rights to others impacts our ability to deal with the crisis around us. Things that already exist apart from things like homelessness and mental health and failing educational systems and on and on it goes. We have a desperate need for the church to be the church. Not to gather in church buildings, not to have theological debates, but to actually be the church. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The day of the Lord is the day of the Lord's return. It's going to come like a thief. It's going to come unannounced, unexpected. We won't know the day. We may know the season, but we won't know the day. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? That's a very germane question. If the creator of heaven and earth is coming back to the earth and he's going to interrupt time, you want to be prepared for that. If our world and everything in it is going to face the judgment of God and destruction, what kind of people should we be? It's worth noting, he doesn't say, what should we do? It starts with who we are. It's more about character than it is activity. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. We're given some very specific responses. We should be holy people. We should aspire to be godly people. We should look forward to the day of Jesus' return, not dread it. It's not an intrusion or interruption. It's the only resolution to the suffering of humanity. We have had millennia to work out our problems. There is no evidence in human history that human beings, apart from the Spirit of God, will work together to solve our problems. We will work together to gain power over one another. But the only resolution to human suffering is the return of the King. He will rule and reign in righteousness on the earth. And we're told to do everything we can to speed its coming. Holiness. I would submit to you that holiness has not just been a real high priority, at least in contemporary American Christendom. Yet the Bible says without holiness, none of us will see the Lord. It's not optional. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 31 says, the world in its present form is passing away. It's what... Peter was talking about, he said, this world will come to an end. And what will bring it to a conclusion is the return of the king. And we're not particularly excited about the return of the king because we're not sure we want the present system to end. Maybe we think we've got an angle. Or there's something we're looking forward to. But the biblical perspective is very clear 
in front of every one of us is the reality that we will be out of time. Time will run out. It's not theoretical. I asked the guys that help us with video to help us illustrate that a little bit. So they, they pulled together a few clips, just 60 seconds. But I think it'll highlight this piece just a bit about running out of time. Whether you think about it or not, or contemplate it or not, or reflect on it hardly ever, time will run out. It's a certainty. And it is not an attempt on my part to be morbid. I don't want to direct you just towards the end of your life. That's certainly a part of it. But the reality is our lives are comprised of seasons. And the time runs out on every one of those seasons. It's a normal part of maturing. And you don't ever know which season you're guaranteed or which you are not. We don't know those things. And so it brings a significance to every day, to every moment, to every opportunity. You only get one time as a teenager to honor the Lord. So if you're in that season of your life or if you're speaking into the life of someone who's in that season, my suggestion would be to encourage them to lead godly and holy lives as a teenager. Because you'll never redo that. You only get one time to be single for the Lord. And you want to do that in a godly, holy way. You'll only have little people around your house for a very short season. They'll grow up. They may not leave, but they'll only be little. They're going <laughs> to. You only get that window one time. And you want to do everything you can to instill godliness and holiness. What are your aspirations for your children? I know you're in church. I mean the real ones. You, you can take that. We can all unpack that for our own lives. To what extent do we truly have an ambition to lead holy, godly lives? Or do we tolerate it? Do we push it aside and think, I'll, I'll wait to another season? Sow a few wild oats. Do you, do you look at people in other seasons of their lives with kind of a wink and a nod while they pursue ungodliness? Do you think God is kidding? Again, our problem is not outside the church. I don't expect the ungodly to embrace a biblical worldview or a biblical morality or a, a biblical idea around family or biblical perspectives on sexuality. But those of us within the church, we have to. You can't hide inside a church building and think it makes you a Christian. If we could, I'd hide inside the gym. It'd make me an athlete. It just doesn't work. We understand that. Time and eternity, you, you, you need to, time is a mystery, and that, that's really true. It, it's beyond me, and I can't unpack that, but I can tell you biblically that time and eternity are two completely different realms of existence. Two completely different realms of existence. Eternity is not just a long time. Two totally different things. And the bridge between the two, the bridge between time and eternity is God's judgment. That's the bridge. God's judgment is not fully executed in time. You don't know God's full opinion about your life yet. You won't know that until you step out of time. 
Now, you know his perspective. You know his boundaries. You know his encouragement. But you have not yet heard the fullness of his judgment. You won't know that until you're done with time. That's why it's an open book exam. You can be prepared, but you shouldn't be surprised. Holiness and godliness are life choices in time that consider eternity. Why do we choose holiness in time? Because we believe it makes eternity better. It's not always easy. It's not more pleasant. In the immediacy of it, it's not always even more satisfying. But holiness and godliness will make eternity better. And if you are living only for time, you're deceived. If you think you can recite a prayer and then lead your life on your terms, ignoring God's eternity, you've been deceived. And I believe in the new birth, conversion, Salvation, whatever label you use for that entrance into the kingdom of God. Isaiah 34 and verse 4 says, All the stars of the heavens will be dissolved and the sky rolled up like a scroll. The starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine and like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Some prefer the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning in verse 6, God is just. God is just. He'll pay back trouble to those who trouble you. And give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. Isn't that good to know? God is just. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. When is the justice of God going to be fully realized? Not until the king returns. We see some of God's justice in time. Some of God's judgments unfold in human history, but not all of them. But the Lord Jesus is coming from heaven, this time not as as a fragile infant born in a stable in the outskirts of Bethlehem. He's coming with his powerful angels in blazing fire. And he'll punish those who do not know God or who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you can know God, but choose not to obey the gospel. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. And for many, it's going to be a very unsettling day. Jesus said that many would come and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles in your name? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. See, when the Lord comes, it will not be a sad day. The glory of the Lord is when the the majesty, the power of God breaks into the awareness of our physical selves. When you see God and his splendor and his power and his majesty, it's a glorious day. And it says we will marvel at what we have believed. It'll be beyond us. You won't regret having chosen holiness. You won't regret having pursued godliness. You won't regret having chosen that alternative pathway. Time and eternity. See, we all have a God story to pursue. Every one of us. It's not easy. I think we have misunderstood it. I saw a quote. It's fun. It's by Calvin Hill. But it says, an army of deer led by a lion will defeat an army of lions led by a deer. Well, if you've never been invited, I want to invite you today into the service of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not to be a church person, not to be a religious person, not to be a theologian. I want to invite you to serve the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a game-changing concept. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12, I like it in the message. The language is a little more contemporary, but the meaning, I think, is more accessible. We don't see things clearly. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. We'll see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. It isn't as clear right now as we would like it to be. There's a tug of war in our hearts. There's a battle in our minds. Our emotions get pulled in different directions. But there's a day ahead of us when we will see with such clarity 
But the opportunity is in this day, not that day. Now is when we choose holiness and godliness. You see, God desires to teach us the difference between the carnal and the spiritual. When I say carnal, I mean that part of us that is, is from our earthly nature, our Adamic nature. It's the part we inherit from those characters we meet back in Genesis, those first chapters. It's what binds us together. It's what makes human history repetitive. It's what makes the Bible addressive literature. The, the, the human nature hasn't changed. And God's desire is to teach us the difference between that carnal part of our lives and the spiritual. Ultimately, the problem of the carnal is not sin or wickedness. It isn't that your earthly carnal nature's default position is ungodliness. The root of the problem is the fact that our carnal nature is temporary and impermanent. And we have to learn to be at home in the realm of the permanent and the eternal. Your carnal nature will pull you into temporary choices. Eat, drink, and be merry without any concern to the future. It'll take you away from godliness and, and holiness. So you and I, a part of growing up as Christ followers, of maturing in our spiritual life, is not just more regular attendance at church. That's a part of it. I'm not apologizing for church attendance anymore. When it got interrupted, I understood how desperately important it was. For those of us that work in the church, it's more of a hassle. Well, that's true. You're just easier to live stream. We don't have to clean bathrooms. <laughs> but the benefit is not the same. You need to worship with God's people. Find a place, find a way where you can be safe and worship with God's people. But the real goal in all of this, I think, is to learn to be more at home in the realm of the eternal. And I want to take just a minute with that. There's some real benefits to it. There's all new possibilities. Jesus came to, to show us God. He said in the past, it says in Scripture that in the past, God spoke to us through the prophets and in many ways and in many forms. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, the exact representation of his being. And Jesus showed us a new kind of authority, a, a demonstration of power that was beyond us, not just miracles or healings. I mean, that's certainly a part of Jesus' ministry, but a completely different kind of authority and power. He taught with an authority they weren't used to seeing. He spoke to wind and waves. He spoke to dead people and they got up. He could make wine from water. Marketability. He understood power and authority in a completely different way. So there's new possibilities in the realm of the eternity. Don't be frightened by it. Matthew 19, Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. All, you can walk on water. Time is not your master. With God, all things are possible. Why would we not invest in that? With you and me, all things are not possible. We have very real limits to our intellect, our strength, our resources, our time. Everything is limited. It brings a little sense of anxiety to us. Do I have enough time? Do I have enough resources? Is my strength going to hold out? Why would we not invest in eternity? With God, all things are possible. Luke 18, 27, the things that are impossible with man, they're possible with God. And yet we're reluctant to trust him. Like he's going to take something from us. What do you think you have that God needs? Your cash? Do you think Gabriel and Michael, the archangels, are huddled in the corner of heaven? They said, I hope Alan will cut us a check. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Mark 9, 23, everything is possible for him who believes. You see... We haven't thought enough about eternity. We, we have this notion, and it's deep within us, that that carnal part of us has such a grip on our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, that we're in this tug of war. It's my time. If I give God more of my time, I'm going to miss out on what I want. That's real in all of us, folks. None of us escape that. And it's our lack of awareness of eternity. We don't really care about godliness and holiness. This is my time. 
Eternity is beyond our current senses. God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I believe that. It was, it was basic biology that really led me to trust God in my life in a completely new way. Just the wonder of science, the precision, the exactness, the intricacies of it. The more we understand it, the more intricate and exact it becomes. It's amazing to me. But, but your five senses, your ability to see and hear and touch and taste and smell, does not define all of existence. Those are just the tools you have. Your dog can hear things you can't. There's all sorts of aspects of creation that have sensory abilities that you and I do not have. And eternity is beyond our current senses. Hebrews 11 and verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. That our visible world that was not given rise, it wasn't the visible world that gave rise to the visible world. The spiritual gave rise to the physical. Hebrews 11, verse 9, speaking of Abraham, it says, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, his, his son and grandson, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He lived his life in time looking forward to something in eternity. That's why he's identified as the father of our faith. What did Abraham do better than anybody else? He waited. Whew, how many of you want to be world class at waiting? <laughs> no, I'd prefer. He waited. I mean, he lied about his wife more than once. She's my sister. Take her, please. <laughs> I mean, there were some holes in Abe. But he waited. He was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Again, the challenge before us to the ills that face us as the people is not about the hearts of the ungodly. It's the hearts of those that gather under the umbrella of faith who really don't care that much about holiness and godliness. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6 says, We, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. The wisdom of this age is going to evaporate. Verse 9, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. You can't imagine what God has for you. It's why we'll marvel at it when it shows up. It's unbelievable because it's beyond time. There isn't anything in time that compares with what eternity represents. What are we holding on to? Why are you arguing about my time? Why will we not say to the Lord, my days are your days? My strength is your strength. My future is your future. Well, there's things I want to do. You think they're better than what God has for you in eternity? Well, as a matter of fact, I probably do. And therein lies the rub. Jesus said, if anybody would be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. In fact, he said, we have to do it every day. Jesus stepped into time to show us how to be pleasing to God. I mean, you think Jesus could have used his power and had a more indulgent life. But he didn't choose that path. Now, you understand the outcomes. Most of you know Philippians chapter 2. It, it identifies what Jesus did. He, he humbled himself. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He humbled himself, found himself in, the, in human form, became obedient Obedient even to death on a cross. There aren't, there, that's a downward progression. But then there's a little turn. It says, therefore, because of that, God exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Folks, every knee is going to bow before Jesus. Every knee. You will not regret what you invest in eternity. We've had this backwards. Eternity is beyond our current senses. Eternity is beyond our current value systems. 
Life under the sun, our carnal selves, is defined by your success in three areas. The accumulation of power, wealth, and pleasure. Most of us trade ourselves for some, some varying ratio of those things. Power, wealth, and pleasure. Makes the world go round. But eternity invites us into a different value system. There's a greater power. In John 19 and verse 10, Jesus is before the Roman governor, the man that has the authority to condemn him to death. And Pilate says, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have the power to free you or to crucify you? Can you imagine swelling up in front of Jesus? Do you know who I am? <laughs> if you don't have a perspective on eternity, you'll do it all day, every day. See, the only thing that would change that equation is some awareness of eternity. Do you know who I am? And Jesus said, you would have no power over me if it were given to you from above. You might step back just a little bit, Gov. There's a greater power than any power this world holds. There's greater wealth. In Luke 16, Jesus again said, no servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. The Pharisees, religious leaders, very religious people who loved money, they heard all this and they were sneering at Jesus. It's worse than Pilate. Pilate was ignorant. He didn't know the scripture. He knew Caesar, but he didn't know the scripture. The Pharisees know scripture. There's a complete expectation that they would recognize the Messiah when he comes and they refuse to accept him. They are sneering at Jesus. And he said, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What's highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. If you're ungodly friends, if the people who know you that are ungodly, that have no pretense of honoring God, if they think you're doing well, you need to be very careful in your self-evaluation. There's greater rewards. Luke 6 and verse 22, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the son of man. Now you need that little phrase because of the son of man. If people hate you, exclude you, insult you and reject you because of your affiliation with Jesus, Jesus said you're blessed. In fact, he says rejoice in that day. Leap for joy because great is your reward in eternity. Did you know there's rewards in eternity? Little rewards, no rewards, great rewards. Godliness and holiness. If you ring the bell in time, if you get all there is to be had and accumulate all the power that's available and pursue every pleasure that can be experienced and you're unprepared for eternity, what have you gained? There's greater treasure in eternity. In Matthew 6, Jesus is speaking again. The language is so plain. How did we miss it? Our hearts have been hard. Our hearts have been hard. I've spent my life in the church. I'm not throwing stones. Matthew 6, Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. They're subject to decay. Moth and rust will destroy them. Thieves will steal it. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, in eternity, where moth and rust won't destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Invest in eternity. Let that be the ambition for your children and your grandchildren, for yourself. Greater power, greater wealth, greater rewards, greater treasures, and a bit of a warning about the tyranny of pleasure. God created us with the capacity for pleasure. It's not wicked or evil or immoral, but it has to stay. It, it requires self-discipline. It's why self-discipline is one of the fruit of the Spirit. The fact that it feels good doesn't mean you should do it. You can kill yourself with a fork. Not with a puncture wound, just by lifting it. It's pleasant. It tastes good. I like it. In fact, everything God intended for your good, the enemy will pervert it for your destruction. So don't give yourself to pleasure. Enjoy the world and everything that's in it, but don't live for pleasure. It'll destroy you. 
Live for eternity. Live for godliness and holiness. In fact, Jesus' life was not a life of focus. He didn't use his power and his authority to accumulate pleasure. And we're his followers. Again, it's not evil or wrong or wicked, but it's a lousy God. It'll be an idol. The unbridled pursuit of pleasure, we have a word for that. It's called addiction. It will not be satisfied. You cannot satisfy it because there's unclean spirits that will join you in that pursuit and they will never be content. So I want to ask you a question and I know I've got to wrap this up. What's your source of information? Because the information you have really shapes the perspective of what you believe. And again, I know we're in church, so the answer is God or the Bible. But what really is your source of information? You see, if we can acknowledge that we don't really know it all, that our information is incomplete, that we're limited creatures, that we are creatures, that there measure, there's a measure beyond us. This idea that human beings are the measure of all things, we represent the, uh, the, the crowning achievement of evolution is destructive. I had a conversation some time ago. I had a friend who, the company he worked for, moved he and his family to France for several years. And they moved there and his children were young enough that they went to schools there and they learned the language. And, and we, we would talk when he would visit. And when, he, when they finally moved back to the States, we sat down one day and he said, my friends in France believe some very horrible things about the USA. He said, it's really awkward because what they believe about our America is just horrible. He said, you have to understand that all they know about us is what they've been told. They've been given a stream of information. They don't have much experience. I found something very similar with my Israeli friends. The Israelis travel the whole world. And you'll meet an Israeli, you, grab it, you jump in a taxi cab and you, you'll ask your taxi driver who's ever been to America, oh, I've seen all of America. Really, where have you been? I've been to New York, Miami, and Las Vegas. <laughs> and with, with great confidence, I've seen it all. Don't need to go back there. I'm thinking, wow. But he said, my, my friends in France, they, they thought the States was awful. Because all they know what they'd been told was through their media and the sources of information they had or movies. He said, the European media is anxious to supplant U.S. authority enabling them to fill the vacuum. So they fill, fill them with horrible things about us. See, the challenge that we all struggle with is we don't know what we don't know. And that reality makes us very vulnerable. And we've got to humble ourselves and be willing to admit we just don't know it all. And assume the posture of a learner, particularly with God. See, it's that reality that makes propaganda so powerful. If a message is repeated often enough and loud enough, it begins to shape our thoughts and behaviors. We're living in a season of unprecedented propaganda. We have to, as Christ followers, be willing to submit ourselves to the authority of Scripture. Authority comes from the author. It's one of the reasons why cooperating with the Holy Spirit is so important. He's the author. Don't read your Bible like a skeptic. Don't read it trying to find contradictions. Why is that helpful? I mean, God can withstand the scrutiny of your towering intellect. I'm quite confident. So, I mean, if that's what you need to do, you just rock on with your bad self. But it'll be far more fruitful if you'll read it as an operating manual. I'm not suggesting we worship the Bible. We don't worship the Bible. We worship God. Many years ago, and it's been years now, I decided to act as if God were telling me the truth. I would trust him. When I don't understand it, I just try to get my behavior in line until I do understand it. Do I always get it right? Nope. But that's my agenda. I just decided to treat the word of God as if it were authoritative. Now, that choice changed all the parameters for my life. It changed everything. It changed the direction of my career, it's changed how I would address money, how I'd address relationships, how would I do with my time. It changed everything. And some days it makes sense to me, and some days I wonder if I lost my mind. It's not always simple. I read a little paradigm. It's not new, but I think it's helpful. It'll help you understand and interact with your world a little bit. It says, when you meet somebody, he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. 
avoid him. But he who knows not and knows that he knows not is a child. Teach him. He who knows and knows that he knows not is asleep. Awake him. And he who knows and knows that he knows is wise. Follow them. So God's perspective. I told you I was going to wrap it up, didn't I? I'll close with one last passage of Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3. It gives us God's perspective on where we are right now. It says, I want, to, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. Now, if you don't know the prophets and you've never read the prophets, you don't have anything to recall. If you don't believe the prophets, if you don't attach any value to them, it doesn't matter what they said because you're not going to let it inform your choices. So there's an, some assumptions inherent in this. And I don't know where you are with your Bible or that habit or that pattern or the authority that you attach to Scripture, but for the benefit that we're about to unpack, the, the, the predecessor, the preceding notion is that you will attach value to Scripture, not the portions that you want to obey, but the whole thing. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires. Who knew? Well, apparently God did. That as we got to the culmination of the age, that mockers would come, scoffers, people with no intent of yielding to God. And they'll make fun of those who are following God while they pursue their own evil. In fact, the Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah and it was in the days of Lot, so it will be in the days before Jesus returns. And in Noah's day, ever the, the hearts of men were so wicked, God said, I can't endure this. And in Lot's day, in spite of the pleading of Lot, the city was so given to ungodliness, to immorality. They were told in both instances, totally oblivious to God's impending judgment, totally oblivious that they were out of time. There was no time left. Scoffing and following their own evil desires, verse 4. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget. Another way of saying that is they hide the truth. They deliberately forget that long ago, by God's words, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Just a casual glance at geography and you'll know that water has had a powerful force in shaping the world we live in. And they say, oh, they ignore that. No God, no higher power. No arrival of God on the scene. We want to do evil. So where are we, church? Are we willing to pursue godliness and holiness? Are we willing to make those life objectives? Are they going to go into our personal mission statements? Are they going to begin to define in new ways how we fill out our calendar, how we manage our schedules? the things we aspire to, the things we dream about, the behaviors we engage in? Are we going to continue to bet that God is not just? That time won't run out? That there really won't be any justice? That we can live life on our terms and that God didn't mean it? Don't live with the threat of punishment. Don't forfeit the promise of the rewards. The rewards far exceed any judgment, any negative judgment. You want to pursue godliness and holiness because of the promise of the wonder that is ahead of you. It exceeds anything available to you in time. I brought you a prayer, but I'd rather close. You can have that prayer. You can take it and use it all week long. But I'd rather close by giving you an invitation. An 
And I, I think what I'd like to ask you to consider, and I, we can open the prayer here, but I think it's something you'll have to live with beyond just this moment. To repent of carnality. Again, not your blatant, unmitigated pursuit of wickedness and evil. Just our stubborn refusal to think about eternity. Of giving ourselves almost completely to the things of time. We've been too invested in time. And we've had too little interest in eternity. Jesus stepped into time for a very brief moment. And he changed all eternity for himself and all who will believe in him. We can't fully understand the outcome of giving ourselves to an eternal God. But we can understand enough to say yes. Why don't you stand with me? It was a bit ironic that social distancing prevents me from inviting you forward. But God knows your heart. Whichever sanctuary you're in, if you're outside, if you're watching with us digitally someplace else or in some other nation, I want to invite you. I'm going to say a little prayer, but, I, but you, in your heart, I want you to begin to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I have been a carnal Christ follower. Oh, I wanted to go to heaven. I knew I needed my sins to be forgiven. But I didn't really think it was that big a deal. See, I don't want anybody to step into eternity and have everything you've lived for consumed in a moment by God's judgment. God doesn't need our money. You laughed at me when I suggested he needed mine. You've seen my balance. He doesn't need my intellect. I'm confident he doesn't need my physical strength. The only thing I have to offer him is my life. But there's a war inside of me. It's my life and my time, my dreams, my ambition. But you say to the Lord, the book of Romans asks us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to the Lord. It'll change your faith. It'll change your calendar. It may not change your day job at all, but it'll change how you do your day job. Do you understand the invitation? Since I can't give you, a, I'm not going to ask you to move. I'm just going to ask you to move your heart. Father, I thank you for your word, for its power and its authority. Lord, it gives us insight and understanding. And we come to you today in humility to acknowledge, Father, the, how hard our hearts have become, how calloused. Lord, we've had a, a form of godliness and we've had forms of worship, and, but our hearts have been far from you. And we come today to say we're sorry. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Forgive us for our carnality. Forgive us for our reckless pursuit of power and wealth and pleasure and our almost indifference to you. Lord, we ask you not only to forgive us, but we ask you to begin to, to reorder our hearts and our lives. Illuminate the path before us that would allow us to to honor you each day in new ways. Give us a boldness to be advocates for Jesus. Cleanse us. Give us the courage to, to discipline ourselves. And I pray that not one of us would fail to be prepared for eternity. But not just a profession of faith, but, but that not one of us would have failed to invest ourselves in holiness and godliness to be advocates for holiness and advocates for godliness. Advocates for truth. 
to embrace your word and to listen to your spirit and to stand with enthusiasm for the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you for awakening us. Thank you that in your great love for us, you've spared us, you've given us another day. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. May each and every one of us be prepared when we're out of time. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.